Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, David, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for making this space available, and to the, all the sponsors for making it possible for uh, Tilo and I to do this work. Um, Tilo's standing next to me, not just because I don't know how to use a clicker, um, <laughs> but because I'm just going to take a few seconds here at the top um, to set the scene, and Tilo, who's the one who runs the boiler room of work to do all the data um, counting that you're about to see updated, um, is going to, well, he'll get back out of his seat, um, and, uh, and do most of the heavy lifting here um, over the next um, uh, 45 minutes or, or hour. I'll come back at the end to make a few policy observations about our conclusions. But let me just, um, just to add a little bit on the backstory here about this work. You know, about a decade ago now, Tilo and I started looking at early signs of Chinese firms not just doubling down on investment at home, but being willing to interested in talking about doing value-added investments outside China, around the world, that was interesting to us for many reasons. Um, first of all, uh, most people didn't think that was going to happen. They assumed that there was so much investing opportunity for those companies inside China that why would they want to take money abroad? People assumed the, the Chinese government wouldn't let them take money abroad. After all, for the first couple decades, keeping capital at home had been one of the main, uh, you know, tenets uh, of Chinese development uh, policy. But the rationality, the logic, the economic um, uh, uh, utility um, for Chinese firms to start putting direct investments uh, outside the country, around the world, uh, was an, enough of a kernel of an idea that we thought it was, it merited a, a big research agenda. So we started almost 10 years ago, tracking this from the early days. And I think we got lucky, um, because sure enough, the compelling logic for China Incorporated to deploy capital and people and know-how not just inside China, but outside China, certainly has blossomed over the past decade globally. In most recent years, we've seen that start to blossom very much in the OECD and the advanced economies, and not least uh, here in the United States in, in just the past few um, years, such that today, as you're going to see, um, we very much have passed the cro crossover point, uh, and this is a first-order topic in the U.S.-China economic um, relationship. It's a really, really big one. It's also an issue which has happened so fast and developed so quickly that in some ways it's overrun the policy conversation, the policy debate here. Um, many of the uh, 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 legal minds in the room, David Fagan included, were involved in the last major U.S. debate about uh, direct investment policy in 2007 that gave rise to the FINSA regulations we have today. Well, it's a decade later, and now we're starting to have uh, the next round of debate and reconsideration of how the United States um, engages with global direct investment capital flows. Um, and that's something that stands before us just in the year to come, really. Um, this d discussion, this conversation, this debate um, is going to come into uh, come into focus um, in a big way. Um, and as Steve said, um, I think we'll all be better off uh, in China and the United States and elsewhere in the world as well if that debate takes place in a data-driven way. So we do hope um, that the two-way street uh, work we're doing um, is going to be not just interesting to commercial minds and interests, but very much to policymakers um, here in Beijing and elsewhere as they think about what they want and what we need the world to look like to maximize all of our interests going forward. And with that, Tila, let me turn it to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I would like to uh, thank Covington and Burling for providing us with this beautiful facility. And of course, all of the uh, supporters and sponsors for uh, <clears throat> helping us finance uh, this big three-year research undertaking. As Dan has said, um, the two of us have been very closely uh, watching the U.S.-China investment relationship over the past uh, decade. And truly, uh, 2016 uh, was, from my own experience, the most interesting year uh, of all those uh, years. Not only have we seen a uh, 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 really large number of interesting and big deals, 
but we've also seen very important changes in the policy environment that is shaping those flows. And so um, we are really at a point in time uh, where uh, um, there is a lot of uncertainty about the outlook on US-China FDI flows. In China, um, uh, the, the surge of um, capital outflows and the drop in inbound flows has forced Beijing to put in place uh, not only capital controls and outbound flows, but it has also um, reinforced the need for reforming the inbound FDI policy environment. So we are seeing a lot of movement on that end, which could really open up new opportunities for U.S. companies and, and foreign companies as a whole. In the U.S., uh, the, the surge of Chinese investment, which um, I think Dan has moved the slide on, the surge of Chinese investment has rekindled uh, a lot of the uh, existing debates um, about potential risks stemming from Chinese investment, uh, including national security concerns, uh, mostly related to uh, the acquisition of U.S. high-tech companies. Um, we are also seeing um, an increase of discussions about uh, the lack of reciprocity in market access, um, especially driven by a new administration that is putting a, a big emphasis on um, fixing the imbalances in the U.S.-China economic relationship. So there's a lot of things going on, uh, and uh, 2017 will be an important year uh, in terms of policy. And I'm glad we um, have this opportunity today to uh, look at the numbers, take stock of uh, what is going on uh, uh, in terms of commercial flows, and then also later on on the panel discuss some of these uh, policy dimensions. Um, I would like to spend um, you know, about 10 minutes or so to walk you through the most important findings of our latest data update. So we have a foundation uh, for the panel. Um, and I would like to start with looking at US FDI into China, which is uh, the more stable uh, uh, story, I would say. Um, as Dan mentioned, um, um, part of the, um, the, the contribution of this particular research project is it to not just have a, a granular transactions-based perspective on Chinese FDI in the US, but have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison on US transactions uh, in China. And so what we did last year uh, is we, we compiled a database on all US FDI uh, transactions of 1 million and more for the last 25 years. And behind me, you can see what those patterns look like. Um, you know, increase uh, in the 90s, then we have a bit of a uh, decline in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis in 1997, 98, um, and then a big uh, decade uh, of US um, FDI in China booming in the aftermath of the uh, WTO accession in 2000, 2001. Um, a quite significant drop uh, in 2008, 2009 because of the global financial crisis, uh, but a pretty quick recovery because Beijing enacted a stimulus program that attracted a lot of uh, capital expenditure uh, in, in China, which peaked in 2012. And ever since, we've got a, a stable but slightly declining um, uh, investment level um, uh, uh, by, by US companies in China. For 2016, that last bar on the chart, um, we uh, count about $13.8 billion of US FDI in China, which is roughly the same as uh, uh, the previous year. Um, and um, as in previous years, uh, Greenfield FDI, so companies building new facilities from scratch, um, dominates uh, US FDI in China. M&A um, uh, transactions are at a six-year low, which has to do partially with investment restrictions, uh, partially uh, with uh, the very rich valuations of uh, companies in China. Um, and we can certainly, we have a lot of experts on the panel later uh, that can talk a little more about uh, the patterns of M&A transactions um, in, in China. Um, uh, important context is that depending on the data series that you look at, um, global FDI into China actually declined last year for the first time in many years. Uh, if you look at China's balance of payments, we have about a 30% drop of global foreign direct investment into China. So in that context, U.S. investment is actually holding up pretty well, and I'm going to show you in a second um, why that is. If you um, want to get a detailed perspective on the distribution of U.S. FDI in China, industry by industry, uh, you can take a look at uh, page 
pages 18 and 19 of that booklet that you have in front of you, the printed version of the report, which gives you a nice snapshot of uh, what the patterns were. And you'll see that um, in eight of our 14 industries, uh, we record a declining FDI level, and it's mostly in industries that fall into two categories. The first category is industries that already have uh, some level of saturation uh, for an investment um, or severe overcapacity. So if you look, for example, on the left-hand side, I pulled, pulled two of those uh, into our slide deck. The top left um, chart shows chemicals and basic materials. Um, we have a, a, a big overcapacity problem in China in, in, in these sectors, and so it's not surprising that um, U.S. companies are scaling back investments in, in, in these sectors that are suffering from overcapacity, um, despite the one belt, one road promise uh, uh, that is Beijing is hoping to resolve some of these issues. Um, the other category, I would say, is on the, on the uh, left bottom uh, corner of this chart. Uh, it's industries uh, that are labor-intensive manufacturing industries, like uh, electronics, electronic equipment, where China is slowly uh, but gradually losing its, its competitive edge. So a lot of this low-end light manufacturing is now moving to other places, and U.S. companies are scaling down their investment in China, um, as other global companies do. On the flip side, if you look at um, industries with growing FDI, um, um, it is mostly industries uh, um, that are uh, advanced manufacturing technology, most notably ICT, which is on the right top corner of this chart. Uh, we're seeing a new uh, record investment of U.S. ICT companies in China in areas uh, such as um, uh, um, semiconductors, cloud computing, software, all of these uh, sectors are, sh are, are showing uh, big increases, partially due to big demand. So companies are localizing uh, their supply chains, partially because of uh, requirements for local content and uh, joint venture partners, uh, for example, in cloud computing. And that's certainly one of the big concerns uh, that the U.S. business community um, has, and which is something we're going to discuss as well. And then the second category of, of industries that's showing uh, uh, a big growth momentum uh, uh, is on the bottom right, um, anything that has to do with modern consumer services. So we're talking about entertainment, e-commerce, everything that's catering to that uh, fast-growing Chinese middle class. Uh, in, in the entertainment space, uh, that's mostly theme parks at the moment, uh, uh, which is a little different than Chinese investment interest in the US, which is mostly focused on movies. But we're seeing all these, um, all these US companies trying to get into that space, and again, it's a uh, politically complicated um, um, uh, industry, uh, but we're still seeing growth in, in the sectors that are uh, allowing foreign investment. So bottom line is that the main reason that U.S. investment is holding up um, pretty well compared to the global average uh, and also compared to investment from other OECD economies is that U.S. companies are very competitive and strong in those uh, uh, sectors that are um, uh, now it's starting to boom in China, including modern services and advanced manufacturing. <clears throat> now, looking forward to 2017 and beyond, it is difficult for us to project and forecast U.S. FDI uh, into China because, again, most of the investment is tied to big greenfield FDI projects, and so it's slightly... Uh, difficult. We don't really have a lot of uh, real-time proxies that we can use to measure investment activity. Um, but based on um, uh, announced greenfield projects, we think that we'll see pretty stable investment levels in uh, 2017, perhaps even a little, little bit of growth. Um, and I've just pulled a few um, examples um, for uh, big multi-billion dollar projects uh, uh, onto the slide, as you can as you can see, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, movement in entertainment, um, semiconductors. Um, we're also seeing um, big announcements in sectors like uh, electric vehicles, new technologies. Um, so we, we think that that all um, has the potential to keep levels stable. But obviously, the the ultimate question will be to what extent is Beijing moving forward with uh, reforming the inward investment uh, uh, landscape and to what extent 
um, is it delivering on its promise to level the playing field for foreign companies in China? If that happens this year, then we could see as well a bigger increase of US FDI in China. And a um, well, it's it's a little uh, unclear what the capital expenditure will be uh, for for that particular project. So, it is unclear what the capital expenditure will be for this particular project. I haven't put a number on it, so we don't know uh, how much it will be. That's why we can't really put a number on it yet. All right. So moving over to the. Uh, uh, perhaps more exciting uh, story uh, in 2016, that is uh, you, uh, Chinese FDI into the US. And um, uh, what you see here is the same uh, uh, period of time as for US FDI into China. And as you can see, there was pretty much nothing happening uh, before uh, 2005, uh, which is the first blip, uh, uh, counting the first uh, Lenovo acquisition in 2005. Uh, that's coming into the U.S. Uh, and then we see a steady increase of, of Chinese FDI transactions into the U.S., mostly dominated by acquisitions. So about 80 to 90 percent of all Chinese capital coming into the U.S. Uh, comes in the form of uh, M&A deals. And in 2017, as you can see, uh, we have a tremendous increase, a tripling of Chinese FDI uh, in the U.S. from about 15 15 and a half billion in 2015 to more than $46 billion last year. Uh, so a really um, outsized increase with, which has to do both with a structural secular story playing through. So Chinese companies really catching up uh, on, on global investment, trying to um, build out their uh, technology and consumer capabilities. But there's also a, a cyclical element in it um, that um, started in mid 2015 there was great anxiety about the uh, stability of the renminbi exchange rate. Uh, there were concerns about the health of the Chinese economies. A lot of companies uh, and investors in China uh, have been trying to accelerate the, the diversification of their asset base um, and um, ramp up their exposure to uh, OECD uh, stable safe haven assets, which um, explains a, a significant share of that uh, 2016 increase. Moving on to uh, the industry distribution, and again, uh, we have a, a nice snapshot of all um, industries on page 28 and page 29 of, of our report. Uh, and there really, there aren't any industries that don't uh, uh, record an increase in uh, 2017. I think there's two exceptions, which are aviation and uh, agriculture and food, where we're not seeing really uh, big jumps in, in Chinese FDI in the US. In every other industry, we're seeing growth. Um, the single most important industry uh, last year was uh, real estate and hospitality, with a number of very um, large investments in uh, hotels and commercial real estate, $17.3 billion uh, in FDI. And then there's also additional capital flowing uh, through non-FDI channels. So real estate has really been a big driver, about a third of total investment. Um, ICT and high tech was also a big category, and it could have been a lot larger if it weren't for CFIUS and uh, US national security concerns. Um, entertainment, media is, a, is another big sector um, with about $5 billion of investment, um, also uh, politically charged. And then the last category that I think uh, is worth mentioning, we're actually seeing a bit of a decline, uh, but on the bottom right, that's uh, financial and business services. So Chinese companies are um, um, really ramping up their investments in the U.S. Uh, insurance and financial services sector, which is um, important because um, there really wasn't too much investment um, going on before, and um, it is a very important industry for reciprocity uh, debates and, and uh, uh, questions related to market access of U.S. companies in China. Looking forward, uh, to 2017 uh, and beyond, um, the story uh, is um, complicated on the Chinese side. Um, we have um, a better way of tracking Chinese outbound investment to the US because of the um, um, 
high share of MA activity, so we can use that as a proxy. And we're counting up our numbers every month. And um, on this slide here, you can see uh, what we have so far for 2017. And it's perhaps a little surprising because you see all the media headlines about capital controls impacting deals. But if you look at it from our perspective, we're counting completed transactions at the date of completion. We're actually, for the first half of 2017, already above 2017 levels if you count completed transactions. That is because uh, a lot of big deals that are um, uh, that have been lined up in 2016 are now being completed. In the first quarter, that was uh, a big um, stake of H&A and Hilton Hotels. Uh, and for the second quarter, uh, that was uh, uh, an uh, aviation leasing company, CIT, that is uh, headquartered in the US, which uh, was almost $10 billion worth of uh, investment. So we're already at the end of, so those numbers go through the end of April. So already by the end of April, we have exceeded um, uh, the figure for uh, 2016. Um, the outlook for the second half of the year uh, is a little more complicated, uh, as I'm sure uh, the, uh, the deal uh, intermediaries, intermediaries and advisors among you can confirm, um, because of, uh, mostly because of Chinese restrictions on capital outflows. So looking back the last two years, China has experienced very heavy outflows of capital, not just through the FDI channel, but also through other uh, uh, channels. And um, on average, uh, since uh, the middle of 2015, China experienced outflows of, of about $150 billion every quarter, uh, on average, through both the financial account and also uh, grade channels. And if you take into account some of the, the other um, um, uh, non-official channels, it probably was even more than that. And um, Throughout 2016, uh, Beijing grew increasingly worried about those capital outflows, and they decided to uh, 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 crack down on some of these channels, and they uh, imposed additional administrative controls on all kinds of capital outflows, including um, outbound FDI, which um, are biting now. As you can see, in the first quarter, that total net outflow of capital has shrunk uh, to about a tenth of what it was in the previous quarter. So um, these, these capital controls are showing up in the numbers uh, in the financial account, but they're also showing up in uh, global deal making. This is a, a chart that shows uh, newly announced outbound M&A transactions by Chinese companies uh, every month. Uh, and as we can see, it went up all the way, peaked in, in the summer, fall 2016, and ever since we're seeing a a fall in newly announced transaction uh, volumes, and we're now back to about 2015 levels. So it's not a complete crash, but we're seeing a pretty significant uh, deceleration of uh, um, global Chinese deal making. This is also impacting the pipeline, the deal pipeline in the US. This is a count that, that we have internally in our database that shows pending Chinese, the, the value of pending Chinese M&A uh, transactions in the U.S. by industry at the end of each quarter. And um, as you can see, um, at the end of the third quarter last year, we had about $27, $28 billion worth of deals lined up. That has come down to about $12, $13 billion, um, at the end of the first quarter. Uh, and we're also seeing uh, quite a few of deals, these deals not being completed because companies can't get the financing um, out of China, including, uh, I think the most prominent example was uh, Wanda's uh, latest Hollywood acquisition, which, uh, which they had to um, cancel officially for those reasons. So the bottom line is for the second quarter, uh, we'll see uh, for the second half of the year, we're expecting that these numbers will um, come down quite a bit in terms of completed transactions. And so we're not going to end up at a, at a low year. It's probably still going to be the second biggest year in history, and there's some debate about the, the outlook, Dan is, is a little more optimistic than I am. Uh, certainly also a topic that we can discuss on the panel, <clears throat> but I'm expecting the number to come in uh, below last year's 46 billion for the full year. Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention um, 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 that's important for the outlook. Um, we have been mostly discussing M&A so far, and M&A was the single most important driver of Chinese investment in the US, but we are seeing um, one potential growth driver that is um, more clearly emerging over the last year or two, 
which is greenfield FDI by Chinese companies. For most of the past 10 years, uh, Chinese companies have investing a lot in greenfield projects, but all of these investments have been pretty small. They've been trade offices, uh, rep offices, uh, not very capital intensive projects. But over the last two to three years, we're seeing a lot more readiness uh, and uh, ability by Chinese companies to invest in larger scale um, greenfield projects in the US, including manufacturing, <clears throat> including R&D centers, uh, and even things like uh, big chemical manufacturing plants. So these, uh, these dots here all represent big greenfield investments by Chinese companies. And uh, we think this could be an additional uh, driver of growth uh, in 2017 and beyond, especially if uh, some of the trade frictions uh, heat up between the US and China. We could see uh, Chinese companies localizing production to get around uh, trade barriers in the US. Um, with that, I uh, want to wrap up uh, my initial uh, introduction to the new data and uh, hand it back to Dan to uh, um, uh, put these numbers in context with the current policy environment so that we have a, a nice setup for the panel. <clears throat> Tilo, fantastic job. Um, thank you very much. And as you can all see, um, as with our initial data set last year, you know, after doing the first 25 years of the story, we were a little nervous this year whether one year additional would be dramatic, as dramatic as last year. Um, but that extraordinary spike um, of activity from China to the US um, did give us something pretty sexy um, to talk about. And um, I want to talk about it a little bit more in the policy context. So this is what those two lines look like when you put them together. Red is China into the US, blue is US into um, China. So uh, the first policy relevant thing for discussion, and by the way, the things I'm about to mention are, are discussed at the end of the report in the conclusion in some greater detail. The first point I want to talk about is the reciprocity issue, um, which is on uh, everybody's minds. Um, the asymmetry right now in investment flows is really quite extraordinary um, and quite uh, serious. And under business as usual conditions, with general American openness to global investment, and China still behind schedule in bringing down its barriers to inflows in, in important new areas, that asymmetry would only get bigger, which is um, highly um, problematic. Um, I would say if American firms were flat in terms of their growth uh, of FDI into China because they lacked the appetite to invest more in the world's fastest growing economy that will someday probably be the biggest economy on the planet, or if they lacked the wherewithal, the capital to do that investing, or if their own home government here in the United States prevented them from investing abroad, as until recently the Chinese government prevented its companies from going to the United States, then this wouldn't be a story. However, none of those conditions are true. American firms have every reason to want to increase their investment footprint, even in those industries which have overcapacity in China. And I was talking to um, several of the folks here about this before we got started. As a process of rationalizing China's state-owned enterprise uh, sector um, uh, 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 starts to get underway, hopefully this year uh, or maybe next, global firms, even in overcapacity industries, should be part of the consolidation, the rationalization, and there is a long way to go um, before American firms should be flat at $10 billion a year or $15 billion a year in terms of their investment uh, into uh, China. Uh, economically, I would have traditionally argued that the United States wins when more money comes here than American money goes out regardless of this asymmetry in the pattern, provided that our national security screening process works effectively, and also that our competition policy process works effectively. 
that we address national security, and those economic issues which are relevant, which are the competition uh, uh, impacts uh, of having so many firms, so much money from a not entirely market system um, coming into um, the United States. But that's an economist talking. Politically, to be realistic, this is not tenable. This cannot go on like this. The very painful legacy of, uh, uh, of trade imbalances, which are a result of different uh, policy and regulatory environments in the two economies, is very much casting a shadow on the direct in, uh, investment uh, uh, arena as well. And it needs to be fixed sooner rather than later. In fact, some of the direct investment flows are a precursor to trade flows. You cannot sell services in China. Services exports from the United States cannot ultimately take place if American firms cannot first invest in China to have a platform from which to sell services in that economy. Same reason Chinese services firms want to be in America today, in cloud, in finance, and all these new exciting consumer-oriented areas. Um, so this is something that needs to be addressed. Official data show the same picture, but lag about three or four years behind the rhodium methodology for counting what's happening at the margin. So according to MOFCOM or BEA numbers, yeah, there's an asymmetry, and Chinese investment into the US is 10 billion, and US into China is 3 billion, or something like that. What our data do is make it much more real time to see just the size, the magnitude of the asymmetry today to give us a sense of priority and the importance of finding a way forward where everyone feels like there's an effective uh, reciprocity of opportunity on both sides that will reflect underlying commercial logic, commercial motivations, um, and all that, uh, and all that comes uh, along with it. Secondly, as we think through this new debate, this uh, uh, latest round of American thinking about what we want to do in terms of uh, global direct investing, Kilo and I want to make a strong signal of caution to those here in Washington who would want to just pull up the drawbridge now and say, we don't know what's out there hiding in the woods, but it looks pretty nasty, and until we can be 100% sure, we're just going to put the kibosh on Chinese flows into the United States. So I'm, I mean, this sounds ridiculous, right, here in this building not least, but there are actually quite a few people who think that would be the prudent thing to do. It's not prudent when you consider that, while well, in the current year we have this asymmetry, but over 26 years of history now, we still have American assets, deals that have been done in China, at least two, two and a half times the value of Chinese investment in the United States. So we have a really big, uh, a really big interest to protect in China for our own companies that are not just investors there, but they are exporters to China in large part because of their presence in the People's Republic of China today. So we need to be mindful to protect our existing corporate assets uh, in China while we're pushing China to converge with us in terms of the symmetry of the investment environments that we both maintain. And we have to be very mindful not to be hypocritical also. When we raise concerns about a particular sector, we need to be mindful using the data, and I think all that is needed is in this report, showing that U.S. firms have a very large footprint in some of these uh, politically sensitive sectors uh, in China as well. And speaking of politically sensitive sectors, the third point I want to make is that, as Tilo has pointed out, the mix of investment flows in both directions has expanded quite a bit. There are, into, just into the U.S., 10 of the 14 industry clusters that we track saw more than a billion dollars of inflows into the United States last year, five of them greater than five billion dollars of one-year uh, inflow um, into the U.S. And there are strong flows in both directions in some of the most politically and security sensitive sectors. Um, this um, shows the side-by-side, -side, and I think ICT, for example, is the perfect example of that. Um, that for American firms, last year actually 
ICT information communication technology was the biggest single um, cluster of all the industries we saw expanding their investment uh, positions uh, in China. Because of that activity in the tech space, we're all really mindful right now of the differences in the underlying fabric of innovation policy and thinking in our two different systems. The United States has traditionally taken a very market-oriented approach to creating incentives for companies to invest money and people and time and effort in trying to generate new technologies, new innovation, and all that. China has traditionally taken a much more state-involved approach to promoting innovation. And today, for example, we are concerned about things like the Made in China 2025 uh, policy framework and design, right? Um, in fact, if we want to keep these two-way flows going where they are mutually greatest in areas like ICT, I can see no alternative than for China to more converge with American thinking about what works for innovation in the long run. The world is not going to converge with doing it the Made in China 2025 way. One, because it's not our game here in the U.S. and we can't do that well without rewiring our entire system and that's not going to happen. And two, because the evidence still shows that it just doesn't work as well as letting the market figure out what's going to be the most valuable way to deploy capital uh, in the service of promoting innovation uh, in, the, uh, in the longer term. And finally, uh, in, uh, and uh, by the way, this is, uh, this is stacking the bars over the whole 26-year period. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, ICT investment alone. So here we've taken the whole database and just pulled out those industries from it which we consider to be uh, 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 ICT uh, uh, related investments. This is where the growth is. So this matters a lot. But the final point I want to make on this um, topic before I get to my final point is that Foreign direct investment screeners alone, the CFIUS people alone, can't fix this problem. This mistrust, which is giving rise to all these worries and anxieties about the implications of semiconductor investment, for example, this mistrust is rooted in a broader uh, set of anxieties about the U.S.-China relationship in the long run in a geostrategic context. No, there is no FDI fix to this problem. If we don't have a sense of mutuality and convergence of interest between Beijing and Washington generally, then there'll be no way to fix the ICT problem or the semiconductor problem or any of these other interesting, exciting areas of potential uh, for two-way direct uh, investment. So don't try to put all of this on the CFIUS people and the CFIUS community. David's a smart guy, Anne's a smart lady. They can't fix this for China and the United States. They can fix it for some of the companies in the room for, you know, this quarter, but they can't fix this for the long run. This is going to get more of a problem, not less so, um, if we don't have a more, uh, a more general solution. Um, as Tilo said, uh, 2017 numbers might not match the 2000 or exceed the 2016 numbers. I was chuckling a little bit because he and I have um, a big $100 bet um, about this year with me arguing that I think China, I think in the OECD is, or US and, uh, and EU is the way we defined it, will get to 90% of its 2016 numbers by the end of 2017. And it's actually looking good to me based on the first half of the year, um, but uh, some people might still want to cover Tilo's bets um, because the second year is going to be uh, more headwinds because of that fall off in pending um, activity. Um, but that's just 2017. Right? And after a tripling of one year for China into the U.S. last year, none of us should be shocked that there should be a little bit of a breather, you know, a little bit of a sideways uh, movement. Um, but in the long term, Tilo and I have absolutely no doubt that these flows have a tremendous amount of growth um, uh, ahead of them. Uh, that two-way investment U.S. into China and China in the U.S., there's no reason why they cannot both match and exceed the $46 billion one-year number China had into the U.S. in 2016. And I think maybe the most important idea I have to share with you, we have to share with you this morning, I think that is true 
even in light of enhanced security screening on both sides. So even if China and the United States apply the most forceful, reasonable national security screening to flows from the other side, there's still plenty of room to have $50 billion, $70 billion annual flows of direct investment between our two economies. In other words, neither side must choose between national security and economic welfare. We can have both, and in fact, I think both we, uh, uh, good policy can be consistent and supportive of national security by maintaining a general mode of openness to reasonable, non-security sensitive uh, economic flows in both directions. So we don't have to make that choice. Both sides do need to make the choice to make sure that their debate about what they do to investment from the other side is that debate is data driven, that is not just based on instinct and feelings and anxieties, but is based on some kind of analysis of what's actually happening, what the nature of these investments and deals is, and whether we can find the least uh, necessarily intrusive way to mitigate our concerns in order to keep the economic benefits flowing. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, it's a, a pleasure to uh, put out Two-Way Street uh, 2017. I think we're gonna uh, go to the panel next and then do Q&A at the end, or should we do a few questions? Questions at the end. So thank you very much on behalf of Tilo and myself. David Fagan, who is um, obviously here at Covington and one of the leading experts on the CFIUS process. Um, you know, Bob Wong, who's an old friend, who is also now here at Covington, uh, an old friend from his days when he was uh, Deputy Chief of Mission in Beijing. Um, you know, now a non-lawyer at Covington, senior policy advisor at Covington. Back in the days when I was a lawyer, they didn't allow that, but now, now, that, can, now, now that can go on, non-lawyers who are participating. Um, and then Steve Foland, who's at uh, China International Capital Corp, CICC, if you don't know, is really one of the, I think it's fair to say, the, one of the primary intermediators of, of capital flows between uh, the United States and China. Let me start with one technical question for, for actually Tilo and Dan, which is Syngenta. That has the, op how is that gonna be reflected in 2017 data, or it doesn't? The Chinese acquisition, which is just 40 something billion. It's, um, it's 43 or 45 billion. Uh, um, that single acquisition equals the total acquisitions in the United States. So that can totally skew your numbers. What's, what's going to happen? Well, it's a, it's a company based in Switzerland, so uh, we would count it as a European transaction. The Chinese take control. They've got operations in the United States, and we don't reflect it in the data? Yeah, we want. Fair enough. It's obviously the largest transaction that China has ever done outside of its own borders. Um, Steve, you, we're going to see a slowdown, or Tilo and Dan think we're going to see a slowdown this year. What are you seeing? You have, when I was an investment banker, I had a pretty good view of the pipeline. What do you see in the pipeline, and what do you think is, is the year going to look like? Is Dan right, or is Tilo right? Well, let me, let me address it a couple of different ways because it's what is in the pipeline and what do we think is actually going to get done this year. Um, when 
we look at the pipeline, and I work closely with my colleagues in, in Beijing and Shanghai, the pipeline is full in terms of appetite, in terms of Chinese companies looking at overseas assets. Um, and we're in a period now where there's a lot more analysis which is going on, and the targets are identified. The second part of that is what do we think is actually going to get closed, because I think there is a general recognition that the capital controls, in fact, have taken, uh, taken hold. Um, I think that there is a general sense that over time there will be an easing of those capital controls, but the effect is you're probably not going to see transaction volumes pick up until probably early 18 um, in terms of closing. So I think you're going to see some announcements um, working into the easing, but actual transaction closing probably rolling into next year. With the view that, that in, even in 2018, strategic investment is going to be allowed, but kind of investment outside of your core business is going to be limited by, by PBOC and by SAFE? Absolutely. So, and that has been, I think, one of the biggest changes we've seen over the last, call it, 6 to 12 months. Um, what I would call... And, and I want to be careful how I characterize it because a number of the um, acquisitions that were away from core competency of the businesses, we actually uh, were part of the transaction, so I, I don't want to be critical in any way. But what we're hearing from uh, government sources and others is that acquisitions within core competencies or core competencies of the Chinese corporates sort of broadly defined. So if it is a technology or a business that generally is additive to the core business or somehow contributes to the core business, that in fact is going to be permitted by the, by the appropriate regulators. But acquisitions that are far afield from um, core competency, that is going to be more difficult to get approvals for. Are you seeing defaults? Are you seeing cases where the Chinese start down a process um, and then because they can't get the money out, uh, they actually end up paying a breakup, you know, paying a fee for not completing the deal? Well, obviously, it was very public. Um, the recent um, breakup fee that was paid in um, the entertainment field, and that was uh, all over the, the newspapers recently. Um, we're not actually seeing much of it getting to that point. Um, I think there is a sense of discipline uh, among a lot of the Chinese corporates that if, they, if, if there is some indication that they will not be able to get finance, financing, if they will not be able to get the regulatory approvals, the processes are stopping before they actually get to the point of signing an agreement and putting breakup fees uh, at risk. David, how serious is the CFIUS problem? The perception, I have Chinese companies come through my office very regularly, and, and you know, I tell them the problem are human resources, local regulation, all these other things. But the perception is that the single greatest um, barrier to Chinese investment in the United States is, is CFIUS. Is that totally, Chinese have a totally inaccurate view? Or is this really a serious and increasing problem? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, let me just add to, to Steve on the outbound flow. I can think of at least some deals where it hasn't stopped completing them, but it has required them to be restructured. Um, so you have a $1.2 billion deal, three months into the process, that $1.2 billion isn't there, recut the deal, smaller deal, smaller group of assets, six, seven hundred million is there, that deal goes to completion. Um, I think, though, that, that by now folks have learned, so I agree with Steve, that you're going to see less of that going forward because the deal won't be signed up if, if all the cash isn't there. Um, you know, what, what we say to Chinese investors is um, you have a defined process um, so I'm going to describe the state of the world as it is today versus the way it may be. Um, but you have a defined process. Um, it is a process that is geared towards promoting investment and where the incentives are to ensure 
that deals get done. And the incentive to take action is really limited in segments where there's a true national security issue. And if you look at the data, to Dan and Tilo's point, the vast majority of Chinese deals um, have gone through, been approved, completed, including without any conditions. Um, it is a distinct minority that raise true national security issues. When they do, those can be hard issues, and some of those cannot be completed. But the minority is not the rule. Um, and what it means is that, and if you look at the ones that have been derailed for real national security reasons, almost across the board, those can be anticipated, addressed, and, the, and could have been avoided up front. Um, and so you can have a lot of confidence in the U.S. process to date um, if you do appropriate planning, if you undertake the right analysis up front, and if you're committed on the investor side to being transparent and if the deal makes sense. Um, so that's sort of been the rule of thumb to date. That doesn't diminish the fact that if you're on the investor side, you have to be focused, you can be concerned about it, but you shouldn't be dissuaded by the fact that CFIUS is out there to doing deals in the U.S. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say one one big change that we have seen over the last 18 months uh, with respect to CFIUS is Chinese corporates never did that kind of planning prior to signing up a transaction. It was always, let's get the, let's get the transaction signed and then we'll deal with U.S. Regula regulatory problems and, uh, and other issues uh, later. Uh, now, as a matter of course on all of our M&A discussions, there is a CFIUS review in advance where we do the exact kind of planning that you're talking about to figure out whether or not we're going to be able to get through uh, that administrative review. And, it, and if the judgment is not, then what the appropriate planning is uh, in advance of actually signing something up. So I, I agree. That they're, they're learning that lesson and they're getting smarter about it. There are still instances where the potential national security issues are underappreciated, um, and therefore parties can are, are sometimes surprised. Um, the the other thing I, to to answer your question in terms of the way it is right now, what we have said, and I think it's bearing out, is at this moment in time, for through this initial transition period into the new administration with the legislative focus that's out there, if you had an easy deal a year ago, it's still going to get done. If you had a deal that may have had some CFIUS complexity, so it was moderately hard, that's still going to get done. It may be a little bit harder, but it would still get done. If you had a deal before that was very complex, was going to present hard national security issues, was going to require real compromise and contortions from the transaction parties and with the government to get it done, those are the deals that right now are much less certain. And I don't think you can have a lot of confidence for those deals going into them. For everything else, I still think we have a fair amount of confidence that will get done. You say, David, you say if these had been properly structured at the inception, CFIUS wouldn't have been a problem. Give us some examples of, of what that would mean. Well, I, I'm, it's, it's less of a structuring issue and more is it a deal that's really doable in light of what the underlying assets are as well as what the potential national security concerns are. Um, if there are concerns, I, I think there's, there's a perception out there that you can structure around national security issues. You can't really structure around national security issues. If you structure around something, for example, so that CFIUS doesn't have jurisdiction, well, there's an argument there that the national security issues are not as acute because the foreign investor doesn't really have control. So you're, you're addressing the national security issues. Um, there are transactions, though, that they have cratered, um, and the perception is it's because of CFIUS, but it's really a combination of the CFIUS concerns and the party's expectations going into them. And alignment is not just alignment in terms of how to structure a transaction. It's alignment with respect to what your expectations and objectives are for the transaction and whether those are realistic in light of what the potential regulatory constraints can be. 
and you have to have that up front. That requires planning, not just on the actual deal terms, but understanding how it's going to be reviewed, what might be required to get it done, and ensuring that the objectives of the transaction can be realized at the end of that. Um, and some of the deals, I think, that have, have gone sideways probably are ones where, given what the party's expectations were, they shouldn't have been entered to begin with. Do we have any data on two things? One is, is you know, what percentage of deals actually are blocked by CFIUS, since it's not a transparent process. And second, and maybe CICC would know something about this, but how many transactions, what, how many transactions are not entered into? They don't start down the road because they're afraid of, of CFIUS. Do we have any idea what those are? First one, maybe there is data. The second, I doubt it. But David first, and then Steve, the, the, and then Bob. There are, maybe there are absolutely transactions that are not entered because of CFIUS concerns or just the realities that they, they shouldn't be entered. Right? I mean, um, so there's a lot of that. Um, whether it's a predominant number of deal, you know, deals are explored and they are not consummated for myriad reasons, of which one may be regulatory issues. Um, and so that certainly happens. With respect to the, the numbers of transactions that are not um, completed because of CFIUS concerns, um, so they're, the, the government's a couple years behind releasing their data. There's supposed to be an annual report every year. The data is available, I think, the last for 2014. Um, so, uh, but that being said, you know, uh, the, the data is out there, it's just not public. Um, and I haven't seen it, um, but I would guess in the neighborhood of, um, based on the 2014 numbers, you've got somewhere between around 10% of the transactions, 10 to 15%. Um, as transactions expand into areas that are more complicated for national 10 or 15% of all deals? Of Chinese deals. Chinese deals. Yeah. So you still Very have 90% that are going through, right? Um, as the transactions expand in sectors and into sectors that are more complicated for national security reasons, including ICT, you're going to have more deals that run into problems. Now, of that 10, this is, this is the Fagan number. This is not the official number, right? But just from experience, if I were to try to ballpark it, I would say that. But of that 10%, the, the subsidiary question is, how many were really blocked by CFIUS, or how many could have been comp consummated, but the conditions to consummate them were ones that the parties did not want to accept? And so I, I don't think you can say it's 10% CFIUS just outright blocked it. It's whatever the number is, there's a, there's a, a subsidiary number. It could have been done if the parties had anticipated the issues up front and were willing to accept the conditions that would be required to complete it. Which are some levels of control, which are spinning off parts of the business, I mean things. Restrictions on governance, the, the expenses that would be required to modify certain business practices and then monitor them, maybe restrictions on certain, certain customer sets. There, there are business implications to mitigation. There's also governance and ownership implications. And sometimes the mix of conditions that the government would require to get the deal done are ones that don't align with what the business objectives are. I'm not going to be, uh, I wouldn't even go there and trying to predict the, the number um, that, that might ultimately be blocked. But because I can go one step before that, and talk a little bit about the planning that, that is going in in advance, given the realities of the CFIUS process. Um, what we're finding is that a lot of our Chinese clients who are looking at US, uh, U.S. assets in particular are going through that kind of analysis now from a business standpoint and from a, an operational standpoint. And, and there's a little bit of a, a discussion around the segregation of potential assets that are, uh, that have national security, security implications and a reality that that's, there's going to be a lot of discussion. And then the follow-on part of that is, well, how key are, uh, is that business or that asset to the overall transaction that's being contemplated and doing some planning around that in advance? Um, I will say anecdotally we have not seen 
flat-out rejections by CFIUS in any meaningful way at all. Um, it's obviously a, a different discussion now than it was, you know, a period of time ago, but um, it's just, it, it is one more transaction item on, um, one, uh, on the list that we discuss and, and work around and, and plan around. So I'm sorry, no hard numbers on this one. <laughs> do you, Tila, do you yeah. remember the number? You might remember Tila the wanted to. Yeah, so so um, um, we, we actually do keep track of, of CFIUS in our database. We haven't put out uh, <clears throat> anything publicly, but I think uh, the second half of 2017 might be a good time uh, to release some of these numbers, but they're broadly in line with what David just said. The other um, aspect that I want to mention is that <clears throat> um, uh, the China General Chamber of Commerce actually does a, an annual white paper where they do a survey uh, of Chinese companies, and they're asking a the question, um, <clears throat> what, is, what do you perceive as a problem for investing in the U.S.? And if you look at that, um, CFIUS is, is actually surprisingly low in the ranking. It's, it's other things like uh, uh, financial regulations, uh, competition. So CFIUS actually, if you want to get a sense of how Chinese companies think about CFIUS, um, uh, I recommend you uh, to take a look at that white paper. Uh, it gives you a pretty good perspective. Bob, D Dan said... I think quite correctly that you can't look at this in isolation, that you have to look at it in the context of the U.S.-China relationship. How, how does this, how should we kind of view uh, the FDI in the context of the U.S.-China relationship, both its upside and its downside? Let me say I've de developed a lot more respect for lawyers since joining the firm. <laughs> I want to make that very clear. Uh, the, uh, We're paying you to say that, Bob. <laughs> but uh, on the question itself, I think uh, there's ob obviously a very big question mark in general in terms of trying to predict what the administration, this new administration, uh, will do in terms of U.S.-China relations. But for the most part, I think uh, maybe Ambassador Roy and others would agree, I think for the most part my expectations have been um, – well, my expectations have been a little bit stronger than what I've seen since then in terms of U.S.-China relations, uh, the, the willingness to deal, the, of course, the, hundred, the, the early harvest uh, and the meeting at Mar-a-Lago. So I think if you compare the campaign rhetoric and even into the election a little uh, after the election, I would say what has transpired since uh, has uh, seems to be would warrant more optimism in terms of the relationship moving ahead. And I was just in Beijing in April as well last month and talked to a lot of my contacts and friends there. And I think the feeling in China, and I think this relates to it, uh, is that in fact they now feel that uh, they're able to, I guess using the cliche, deal with President Trump as a transactional person. There's a lot more comfort, a lot more sort of relaxed attitude in terms of saying, yes, we can deal with uh, President Trump and his administration. Uh, and, of course, the latest was the um, announcement of the early harvest. And, uh, and uh, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, uh, of course, I, I, from, I think from the perspective of most of us, it was a minor uh, achievement. Uh, but from the point of view of Wilbur Ross, when he was pre presenting it, he presented it as a major, major achievement, accomplishing things that we haven't done in 10 years, 15 years, historic. But clearly there, there is at least um, a sign that both sides are able to negotiate and that we did get something in terms of the beef and the financial services and the credit agencies, et cetera. So uh, I think it's a start, and I think Secretary Ross did recognize that it's, um, it's the beginning. Uh, the... The question I now have is, of course, it's easy to, to talk about what has happened now and what we see. The more difficult question, which I really cannot answer, is uh, what's ahead? I mean, there are a lot of different variables. Uh, Dave talked about some geostrategic issues, and we're still waiting for that in some ways uh, with, with the South China Sea or Taiwan arms sales or North Korea. So those are variables that I think is very difficult to predict uh, first of all, in terms of how they, how they actually happen or occur, but beyond that, how, what the reaction would be of the Trump administration, uh, which would include Defense Secretary Mattis and McMaster, National Security Advisor. So that's a, a real question that I think we, we're 
going to eventually have to confront these geostrategic things and how both sides react to it. Have we seen any changes in CFIUS during these 120 days? Um, well, so anytime there's a change in administration, there are you have some ramp up time for everything. Um, and that's certainly true in the case of a, of a regulatory process that touches on multi-billion dollar transactions and brings into play the entire government and has policy implications. Um, so um, it is also a process that requires sub-cabinet positions to be filled, really. Um, it, it, by law, there are political people who have, politically appointed people who have to approve transactions, um, either at the assistant secretary or at the deputy secretary level. Um, and we have, through the first 120 days, most of the sub-cabinet um, positions have, have not been filled. And so you're, you're in this dynamic where you have, it's a very professional process and the process itself has not changed. But the people who are directly running the process are having to go up, even in some cases, to cabinet officials who are stretched very thin um, to manage matters and to get approvals for matters. At the same time, CFIUS is on pace for a record year by far in terms of the number of transactions that it's reviewing. The difference between this year and last year is as an overall percentage, there's not as many Chinese transactions. There's still a, a lot of them, a fair number of them. Um, but, you know, the latest numbers that we have in terms of filings are it's into the 90s by now. Last year, 170, 180 cases. So if you were to extend that out through another couple of quarters, I mean, you're on pace for anywhere, even if it slows somewhat, 250 to 300 transactions reviewed. That's stretching the system. Um, and then the last piece is of course there is policy discussion and debate both on Capitol Hill and within the executive branch over what to do with respect to CFIUS in particular on China. So, you know, it has been publicly reported that there's a couple of potential pieces of legislation that will be introduced. Um, I think we're expecting that to happen sometime, you know, in the next month or so, at least one. I don't know that China is going to be named anywhere in those pieces of legislation, but they are definitely geared towards the um, relationship between the U.S. and China on investment issues, uh, very broadly defined. And um, there's a lot of sort of noise within the, the system and in, in Washington on the administration looking broadly at how to deal with this policy dynamic where you have the two largest economies in the world who are also arguably the most significant political, military, and intelligence rivals. Um, and where CFIUS fits within that is one of the policy tools. So in that context, um, has it changed within the first 120 days? The, the process itself hasn't changed. The professionalism hasn't changed. But all of those factors are, um, are, are creating viscosity and, in, in the system and and making it um, making it a little bit more of a conservative and a cautious process right now. Steve, can I add something? Just, sure. Yeah. On the administration, I think although we cannot, we don't see anything at this point. There are sort of um, maybe minor indicators out there. Um, as you know, Treasury takes a, a lead on the CFIUS issue. The fact that we started off by essentially. Um, we, meaning the Trump administration, uh, started off by essentially putting the currency manipulation issue to the side and moving ahead. The fact that Wilbur Ross, uh, 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 Secretary Ross, in his um, announcement of the early harvest deal, really put an emphasis on, on uh, inviting Chinese investors to select USA, which of course they had come every year since I don't know when, but he actually made an extra point at the end. The tenth point was, hey, we're inviting a whole bunch of investors in from China. So there's really, I think, minor indicators. I wouldn't say they mean much, but, but clearly the administration, uh, which does this, may not be as strong in terms of trying to push for CFIUS change or reform or broadening it. 
Can you give 30 seconds? If this were a New York audi audience, I think no one would know what Select USA is. In Washington, maybe there are some, but could you give a short description of what Select USA is and what Secretary Ross meant welcoming Chinese investors to come? Sure. Select USA is a, a Commerce Department uh, directed program where we invite thousands, over, th I think maybe a couple thousand. I'm not sure if someone from Commerce is here, but. Uh, investors from all over the world to look at investment opportunities in the United States. It's going to be this year. I think the big event this year is June 19th. So it's a whole day, uh, but it goes to 20th. And uh, usually from China, I think last year might have been close to 100 um, people came, maybe a fewer in terms of companies, actual companies. Uh, but China normally is one of the larger uh, delegations that, that come to the Select USA. So it's just called Select USA, meaning choose the United States to invest your money. David, is it possible for you to give a, a, nuts, a nutshell summary of what these potential legislative changes are and what the implications are for Chinese investment? Um, I'll try. So uh, one is to to look at whether economic factors, um, and it's, it's Dan's and Tilo's slide 13, whether reciprocity should be factored into the consideration. Um, whether there's actually legislative text that comes out that would do that, um, and whether it's broadly defined or whether it's focused on a particular category, such as state-owned enterprises, um, we don't know. But certainly one of the the points that has been discussed is the extent to which the CFIUS process should take into consideration market access, reciprocity, economic factors, or even look at something like Canada, which has this net benefits test. Um, leaving that aside, those who would focus purely on the national security piece and have CFIUS remain focused on the national security piece, uh, some of the concerns that are animating that potential legislation include transactions that um, result in access to know-how um, processes, especially in the ICT sector, that there's a perception those transactions may not be reviewed by CFIUS. They might not currently be covered transactions. They may be minority investments that aren't covered transactions. Um, and that there's this transfer of leading innovation and know-how occurring between the U.S. private sector and China that somehow will disadvantage us and advantage them. That's sort of broadly defined. There have been several press reports about this internal report that the Department of Defense issued on essentially this issue. Um, and, you know, without getting into potential legislative text or, or whatever's in that report, I think those, that policy issue is part of what is animating a potential national security focus. I think, frankly, both within on the Hill as well as within some parts of the administration. Anyone on the panel, the, would, a BI, would a bilateral investment treaty help? And what are the prospects? Who, who wants to take that one? <laughs> I think everybody could comment. Or Dan, you want to comment on that one? Or well, I'm happy to see others step in to the fray first. Sure. Um, Nobody wants to touch it. Yeah. Yeah. I think most. Of here. Yeah, huh? I'll just say a word. Uh, I I think I've seen reports, um, maybe fake news. I don't know, but I've seen reports that the uh, that it was brought up in Mar-a-Lago. The, the, the question of whether or not we should be resuming it or not. And I'm not surprised. I would imagine with all the investment that, that uh, Dan and uh, Taylor have talked about, it's, it's got to be something that uh, would be of interest. And, uh, and, but it was not raised uh, by Commerce Secretary Ross uh, when he gave us uh, at the press announcement of the uh, early harvest. But my, my, I suspect that it, it, as most of you know, it was really uh, going forward quite aggressively towards the end of the Obama administration, uh, probably with a little bit of a hope that it could be done um, you know, at some point, at least the beginning of the end at some point. But, so I, I would not be surprised if, in fact, they took this up again uh, before too long. And I think it would be 
it, it probably will be a more difficult discussion, uh, especially that would involve reciprocity issues and so on. But I think, I think it would not be surprised if it happened this year, started, resumed negotiation. Not not happen, resume negotiation. Oh, so we resume negotiations yeah. as opposed to conclude. Isn't it 90, mm -hmm. 95 percent done? It's only a question of China's negative list? Yeah. That's a large part of it, but it's a very large negative list. <laughs> so as to the question as to whether it would be helpful um, and whether there's a bilateral treaty in place, the 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 issue that that we think about often and are, are talking about is exactly uh, was referred to earlier. For, for those transactions that are outside of CFIUS purview, which are some of the technology transfers and the agreements and the minority investments, that's the issue where a bilateral treaty actually could be incredibly helpful because it's going to put some definition around what is going to generally be in favor or acceptable or with, within the purview of, of what's going to get uh, past regulatory review. So that treaty could be helpful in terms of the, the, the flows both, you know, both ways, actually. Um, so it could be an incredibly helpful tool if, it, if something like that were to be put in place. So I, I agree with, with both of those comments and really defer to, to, to Steve and, and um, Bob and Dan. I, I will say it just as a, as a confidence building measure, it seems to me it could be helpful but only if it's really a two-way street. I mean, not, not to, to, to steal from, from Dan and Tilo, but that I think is the fundamental issue is, you know, we actually have a pretty open investment environment and, and maybe we can provide some better definition and the like to it. But the, the, the bit would be constructive if um, I think symbolically for Chinese investors coming here, it might give them more confidence, but more significantly, substantively, if it actually facilitates investment going in the other direction. I think that's been part of the issue. Mm -hmm. I just want to add a final, uh, one more thought on this uh, question. Uh, although I agree with ev absolutely everything that's been said, would it be helpful? Absolutely yes, because it means we are negotiating and not via Twitter but via the traditional tried and true process of sitting down at a negotiating table with a process to work through our mutual lists of issues and concerns and systematically working toward a mutually agreeable solution uh, for them. And yes, helpful because negotiating a BIT would certainly be the shortest route to convergence in how our systems handle this topic, this issue of global direct investment flows. We have a trade regime, not everybody loves it, called the World Trade Organization that manages a shared set of norms and principles for how we try to enjoy the benefits of trade while managing our, our, each of our several and joint uh, <coughs> views of the downside of trade. We can modify that regime if we need to. There is no international regime for direct investment flows. There absolutely is not. And so we have different approaches, as David noted, some here looking at across the border at Canada, uh, at the way they handle direct investment flows. Others looking into Europe. Europe and Canada very much looking into the United States and envying us for our more narrowly defined national security approach. Meanwhile, China has an approach that's actually extremely broad where, on the books anyway, they can reject transactions because it's a famous Chinese brand and therefore it should be protected against a foreign investor. Flying pigeon must remain in Chinese hands, for God's sake, right? Um, so the process of, of working toward convergence around what our interests are, after all, investment is not unilateral, it's not bilateral, it's a global uh, flow of capital among firms that are themselves invested around the world. So ultimately, Nothing short of a multilateral approach is going to optimize any of our interests here, whether security or economic welfare. And in as much as China and the United States are by far the two biggest uh, players in this debate right now, um, starting with a bilateral investment treaty negotiation that works toward narrowing the list of disagreements uh, would be by far the best uh, route uh, to get to where we need to go. What would be the three sectors? 
I'm just, there are many more sectors, but if you were to choose three sectors where access is not reciprocal and how we could fight to open, what should we do to open those sectors? What would be the three sectors you'd think about where a Chinese company could invest in the United States, but the U.S. company couldn't invest in China? Um, let me address that in one uh, minute. I just wanted to add to what everyone said on the BIT. I think a big part of the uh, <clears throat> equation will be the enthusiasm uh, uh, by the U.S. business community on, on continuing with bid negotiations. And a, a big, big <clears throat> indicator for that enthusiasm will be uh, what uh, is going to happen with uh, some of the concessions that China made uh, within, within that 100-day program. So uh, especially Visa and MasterCard. So I think a lot of people will be watching how some of these uh, market access concessions uh, made by China, I think by, was it mid-July that they agreed to finally? 16th. Op op 16th of July. I think a lot of people in D.C. and in the U.S. will be watching if uh, China is actually going to give licenses and, no and opening up market share to Visa and MasterCard. And if that happens, I think there there's a real uh, momentum for going back to that bit negotiation table. Um, on the question of industries, um, our data also gives a pretty good um, perspective on identifying where some of the issues are. And um, we had that uh, in great detail in the last year's report. We haven't had a, a chart in, in this year's report, but you can look it up all um, online, which is something we didn't mention. But on the back of your report, uh, there's an, a URL to our project website, which allows you to nicely uh, explore all the data in an interactive app. So we, we're we're putting all of this life, so it should be on there right now, uh, which allows you to explore uh, a lot more in detail. And the industries that we uh, see having uh, big problems in terms of uh, market access in China um, are the usual suspects, um, starting with uh, um, industries like automotive, where there is a clear uh, equity cap on foreign investment at 49%. Um, moving on to uh, financial services is certainly one. Uh, and then the, the, the last one that we identified clearly with the data is uh, entertainment and media, where you know, Chinese companies are technically allowed to um, buy in 100% uh, of U.S. companies. There are some political <clears throat> dynamics unfolding in the U.S. campaigns against Chinese investment in entertainment, but so far, by law, uh, uh, Chinese companies are able to acquire 100% of U.S. entertainment companies. And this is not possible, vice versa, even in sectors like theme parks, which I would think um, is pretty far-fetched, uh, uh, considering those as national security threats. Um, I don't know what David thinks about it, but um, those are the three sectors that we identified as having real problems. And then, obviously, there's a lot of uh, post-market entry uh, problems as well in terms of how foreign companies are being treated, uh, a rule of law, uh, and, uh, and, and other things. But... Also, just a reference to our other partner, uh, MGM Shanghai, they do an annual survey of uh, uh, business climate and uh, doing business, and that, that is a good starting point to get a better sense for, for these problems. Go ahead. Steve? Um, so back to your question of the, the three sectors. Automo automotive was going to be obviously top of the list because there are hard regulations in place um, in terms of the limits. But where, where we see some of our U.S. clients really struggling um, is media and entertainment, obviously, because of the controls on content, some of the other things that drive the restrictions on investment there. Um, financial services is an area of great interest, um, but there are limit, limits on that sector and what assets pe people potentially could have a look at. Um, and there's some interesting, there's some very interesting distinctions being drawn between traditional financial services and whether it's asset management, the bank, banking system, or even some of the emerging fintech uh, companies, which really is a combination of financial services and, and some of the new technologies which we've seen in the U.S. And then within technology itself, and, and there's obviously been a lot of activity in semiconductors, and there's a lot of, of sort of noise in the system right now about, well, maybe the, there may be some further restrictions around direct semiconductor investment, but the next wave is going to be the capital equipment and all of the companies that support that industry and are necessary for that industry. So um, that is, there are no explicit restrictions on that, um, on, on investments in that subsector. 
Um, but that is a sector that I think both, both, both sides are watching uh, to see what's going to happen because there are a lot of discussions underway around um, capital equipment supporting the semiconductor industry. Mm -hmm. If I could add just one more thing, uh, it's not just a matter of market access. It's also a matter of governance, transparency issues, obviously, in terms of the investment flows. And I know that a, a lot of American companies in China and others are very concerned about how the national security law, how the cybersecurity law, all of these things, and the Made in China 2025, you know, how are they all going to play out? And I think all of those uh, probably at some point or another will have to be addressed by in a, in a discussion between China and the United States, uh, how they actually come out because um, right now they look pretty, uh, the cybersecurity law in particular, but national security law as well look pretty ominous uh, for, uh, for, I think, uh, foreign companies in China. So, Yeah, I, I, I agree. I was going to add to the list essentially the, the same point that if you're going to add a fourth, you're going to, it should be ICT. Um, and then you define ICT very broadly because it gets into not only just that core sector, but also everything else that it can touch in the way that they're defining national security and cybersecurity. So, um, you know, Rhodium's done some great work on that too. Um, and the, the risks of deglobalization within that uh, industry. And, um, you know, I'd encourage everybody also to look at that data because it has implications both for China and for the U.S. on on the national security and the economic side, um, and I think that that is you know the it, it, in some sense it should present a harder set of issues than auto and media entertainment because you can't really stop the flow of technology, um, and if you try, there's going to be much broader uh, implications for both countries. Okay, so we've identified the areas. Bob, you're back in the U.S. government, or those who haven't, or Dan, you're back in the U.S. government, those who haven't served, you're, you're negotiating this. Chinese don't do it. What do we do? What do we do? The Chinese don't agree to open these sectors that are opened in the United States. My view of a lot of the regulations, especially with respect to auto, financial services, they were put in place. The Chinese put these regulations in place decades ago when their industries needed protection. It has long ago grown into an economy that it no longer needs those protections. But for their various vested interests that still want those protections. So the Chinese government decides, sorry, we're not doing it. What do we do? What does the United States do? Close our sectors? Huh? <laughs> Well, you've negotiated these, Bob, so I think you're the... No, I mean, uh, relating to, obviously, to what we're now talking about here, and I'm not recommending it, but relating to what we're talking about here in terms of investment flows, you know, one consequence, not so much a recommendation, would be much tighter sort of consideration of CFIUS in terms of what it applies to, et cetera, uh, because the Chinese do want to invest abroad. They do want to invest in brand companies. They do want to get foreign technology, et cetera. And I think um, I can imagine the first consequence would be a, a sort of tougher review of a sort of CFIUS process and maybe even con congressional uh, participation in it. I'm not recommending that, but I think that could happen. But the other thing, even if the government doesn't do anything, I think if these things continue in China in terms of cybersecurity law and national security, other things, uh, then I think the consequence would be that American companies, foreign companies, will begin to invest less in China, and that affects China in terms of its, its um, I think, general uh, goal of attracting at least more high-tech and other kinds of companies into China. In Shanghai, for example, the FTZ in Shanghai and so on. So there is a goal of that. They want to have more uh, you might say, value-added investments but from foreigners. And if that starts slowing down, it's already slowed down a little bit. If it keeps on going down, not just from America, but from other places, then it actually harms China. And so that's a, that's a consequence. It actually has to bear on its own, without, even without the government doing anything. So uh, I want to address and I underscore that Bob was recognizing that this is a potential consequence as opposed to rec a recommendation. But just to 
maybe play out why CFIUS is a poor tool for it. CFIUS gets to look at single transactions, one at a time. And if you take an action on a specific transaction, that does not address the broader set of issues. It may send a message, but the actual consequence with respect to that action, if, for example, you were to build in reciprocity on something that otherwise wouldn't have a national security issue, and, and the determination is made that that can't go forward, the, the consequence is felt by the shareholders on the seller side, it's potentially felt by the employees of the company that would be in scope, especially if the transaction would help grow the business, provide more opportunities with a Chinese partner. Um, what it does not do is either protect national security or address the underlying market access issue. Um, so I, I think it's natural for there to be a discussion and an examination of all the tools, and in that context, you can understand how CFIUS would be examined or considered as a potential tool, but when you actually look at it in application, it is a very poor tool to address this. And you're asking the really hard issue. So, you know, what if they just don't, what if China doesn't respond and doesn't open access? I don't know that, and I'm sure, Bob, this is why you, you asked, you know, if somebody else could take it on. There's, there's clearly not an easy or direct answer. Um, I would say part of the answer has to be it cannot just be the United States responding. And if you broaden the issue to other countries and allies, because it is not just a U.S. issue, it is also a European issue, it's Canadian, it's Australian, it's other parts of Asia. If you broaden the issue and make it more multilateral, then hopefully you can exert enough pressure to get them to start to respond. Um, we. I fully agree with David that CFIUS wouldn't be the right um, <clears throat> uh, platform to address these things. But um, one of the areas that people are looking into and that people should be looking into is competition policy. So every deal not only goes to CFIUS, but most deals also have to go through a, a merger review process, uh, <clears throat> which is defined by size and, and market impact. And <clears throat> I think there are options uh, and other um, <clears throat> economies are already exploring some of these uh, um, options, including the EU, to have different standards for uh, acquisitions by, for example, state-owned companies or uh, um, companies that are <clears throat> associated with a certain jurisdiction. And those things could potentially be redefined by law. And I think the U.S. being a democracy, um, if this perception of unfairness and uh, lack of reciprocity continues, I think we will have Congress uh, step in at some point and, and propose some of these changes. Whether they take the CFIUS route or competition policy route, that's to be seen. Uh, I don't know that this is a sort of a matter of linking things, but one thing, obviously, that could be considered, not in a very direct sort of way, but uh, obviously the U.S. market for China is huge and significant. So I'm not saying we're not already implementing our regulations correctly and appropriately, but stronger, more aggressive trade remedy actions, enforcement, things of that nature, uh, could send a signal because that they do rely on, um, on the U.S. market for continued growth in China. So I think I wouldn't be surprised if it's not directly linked, but that things are happen on the trade remedy side. I add uh, one small additional point on this. There would be one answer, Steve, if we were in a pitch black room and there were somebody else in the room with a baseball bat, and we had a baseball bat, we had to decide what we were going to do in a pitch black room. But the first thing we can do here is flip the switch and turn on the lights, and that means opening up this report so that we can actually see if it's true that we don't have a trend line in a positive direction, that there are is improvement in the re reciprocal flow of U.S. investment in China. As I said earlier, until this work, body of work, 2014, I mean, we're, we're steering a ship here by looking at reports on icebergs three years ago, right? That, you have to take a precautionary approach if you're a security analyst, and your job is to make sure that the security considerations of the United States are, are being uh, uh, attended to. But if you can get current iceberg data, then you can be a little bit, you know, less cautionary um, in shutting everything down until proven benign. We don't have to take that kind of 
uh, a, um, uh, an assertively cautious approach if we have better data to work with. And it's not perfect what we've done. We're, we're doing more. And, but it's, it's a pretty good, um, um, pretty good tool. One last question from me, and then I want to open it to questions from what is a very distinguished audience. This, we've obviously talked about the issue of capital control, but really haven't dug deeply into it, which is obviously it's really begun to bite. These are existing regulations that have been enforced much more tightly. Um, in meetings that I've had with the Chinese government, they have said that these are temporary, and we know that over time they erode. That one, one official put it, the Chinese people are smart. You put in place capital controls, and over time they will figure out a way to get around it. And we know that's going to happen, so we don't want these to stay in place for a long time. Um, Steve, you talked about a pickup in 2018, which I think is partly based upon some I assume some theory that capital controls are going to be relaxed at the end of this year. What's CICC's view? And I, get, I think part and parcel of it is what CICC's view of where the reserves are and where they're trending. In other words, how much can they relax without kind of the bottom falling out of the reserves? And I mean, Dan and Tilo's chart showed $150 billion a month. A quarter. That's, that's serious money. Um, so l let, me, let me do it in a couple of different, um, couple of different pieces. Um, I think our view generally is capital controls are going to start easing because I think your po point is absolutely correct that, it, that there is a recognition that once the government put capital controls in, a lot of um, the Chinese corporates and others were going to find ways around them over time. Um, and there obviously is no official statement to that effect, but that's the reality. And our sense is, um, and I'm getting this strongly from my colleagues in, in China, is that capital controls and all the indications are that they're going to start easing over time. And probably nothing's going to happen, you know, until after the November, uh, the November sessions. But you'll, going into, going into um, that event, you're going to start seeing some discussion around it, and then you're going to probably see the official easing, you know, post post November. Um, CCC has recently done some research looking at at what reserve levels are, and um, we think that you're going to probably see reserve levels coming down um, because of a decision that is likely again a November time time frame decision that. Reserve can come down, and, and, and they're probably higher than they actually need to be right now uh, for, a lot of, for a lot of different reasons. But they're going to come down, and that's going to be, in part, um, one of the contributing factors to the easing of capital controls. So you're likely to see that, again, post-November, uh, post -November, and that's going to play right into why our, I think our House view is that um, there will be a lot of discussions second half of this year leading into the, the easing of the, of the capital controls and then transaction volume picking up uh, in, in Q1, Q2 of 18. Tila. I'd like to ask a question. Um, so uh, Chinese deals have traditionally um, had a higher closing risk than, than probably deals from other um, jurisdictions. Um, and I'm sure the capital controls haven't helped. Um, so to what extent have those capital controls damaged uh, the uh, <clears throat> chances of Chinese buyers to get deals uh, if you talk to U.S. sellers and um, um, how quickly you think these uh, uh, considerations are going to go away once restrictions are lifted, given that restrictions actually were never formally announced, so everything currently is informally. So how, how are you going to resolve that? How are you going to sell, how are you going to pitch Chinese deals to uh, U.S. buyers, uh, sellers? Sorry. So the, the challenge is, and, and I think there's a general recognition in the in the M&A market and, and elsewhere. I didn't do that, did I? Um, that there is a higher risk to closing by Chinese buyers historically. And when you when you actually do the analysis, there are a number of large Chinese corporates that, in fact, have transacted in the U.S. over multiple times, 
and what I would describe being the Chinese premium, which is the risk of nonclosure for some of those Chinese corporates, in fact, is coming down. And they're treated the equivalent of buyers from any other country around the world because they have transacted on multiple occasions. They have gotten to the process conclusion at the price with very little, with, with very little Chinese specific deal risk. It was just the normal transaction noise uh, that you get to. Um, in our discussions with U.S. Uh, sellers right now, um, there is a higher degree of uncertainty, and that's rolling through both pricing discussions as well as when you start talking about breakup fees and some of the other things. That's where that uh, that's where that's being addressed right now, and we've had to give much higher assurance of where the capital is coming from and how it's likely to be financed earlier in the process than I otherwise would ever address those kinds of issues. Um, and some of the early deposits that go on you know, prior to funding a full breakup, um, some of the early deposits through a process have actually had, uh, they have increased in size. Um, they have increased uh, in terms of both stages. So I've seen recently in a transaction where we had Upon exclusivity, upon actually getting close to signing, we had different steps in the transaction, and there was a deposit required at each step in that transaction as a hedge against the uncertainty around capital controls. Um, an interesting side is that the seller actually specified the bank in the U.S. Uh, as evidence, in fact, that, that our Chinese acquirer had access to capital offshore. Um, and a lot of that is just anecdotal, but it's evidence of people's uncertainty around that, and particularly U.S. sellers. Um, I think what happens is that the U.S. sell side advisors they're very clued into what's happening uh, in terms of capital controls. Uh, a lot of, as simply as the large global banks have presence whether it's in China, whether it's in Hong Kong, and, and they've got a good sense of what's going on. So even though there are no official pronouncements, there's a general sense of what really is, is able to get done. Um, and there's a lot of diligence around what financing sources are going to be. My expectation is that post-November, when there is, if we're correct, a general easing, that's going to work itself into the market. Um, and I think, frankly, when you start seeing some transactions getting done on, t on schedule without that being such a, a prominent part of the discussion, it will just continue to uh, accelerate the pace. I, I want to add um, one very uh, wonky macroeconomic point uh, on this topic. Um, we're concerned right now with this question about short-term policy interventions, capital controls meant to address short-term balance of payments anxieties and uh, speculative worry about panic in the market and all these kinds of things. But if we look at the long-term fundamental situation here around the balance in Chinese capital flows, not just direct investment but other flavors of capital too, right, it all comes down to this the outflows from China are hardwired. Chinese corporations have a tiny global footprint today compared to their multinational competitors from Japan or the United States or the European Union or even South Korea. They're at the front end of that process of doing through acquisition or greenfield, building up a global presence so they can be directly engaged with us here in America rather than counting on the goodwill of Walmart shareholders to intermediate retail for Chinese manufacturers back home, right? So this is going to be a decades-long process of Chinese corporations needing to be deploying a trillion dollars of money or more, much more, around the world. On the other side of Chinese capital flow over the decades to come, the typical Chinese saver, household uh, or the national pension funds or corporate is 95 percent or more in a single emerging market for their portfolio called China. All of that savings, so much of it, is still inside China. There naturally has to be some diversification to hedge against 
the risk of that one emerging market not having a great five years, let's say, at some point it happens to the best of us, by deploying some more of that Chinese savings abroad. So these are hardwired realities, and they're natural. That's what nature looks like when you become wealthier. What's not hardwired is the global inflow into China. There's the potential for it. There's every reason why America, Inc. and Germany, Inc. should be putting hundreds of billions more in China the same way that China is putting hundreds of billions in our economies. But they won't do so if there's not a level playing field, uh, a reasonable a marketplace, a set of uh, conditions to operate in. Global savings, right? The, the big question of the year, Steve, Steve, I'd love to talk to you about this, is China's appetite for global uh, investment in bond market inside China, a big project for this year. Just announced a new Hong Kong, Shenzhen bond direct investment channel, for example, and there's lots of others. MSCI may open up China for equity investing this year as well. If that all goes well, which means people are confident in Xi Jinping's economic plan, that this is going to be a good place to invest, there will be trillions of dollars of global deployment into China. At the same time, we're talking about these trillions of Chinese deployment in our economy. If the Chinese side of the regulatory deal doesn't come through, and nobody really wants that Chinese debt in Liaoning province tied up in 100 steel companies that have no customers right now, then that money is not going to flow into China. We're going to continue to have balance of payments, anxieties in Beijing, and they're going to have to continue to maintain capital controls forever <laughs> because there's no way to get around the fundamentals here. So for what it's worth, this data is very you know, short-term and timely and immediate, but it exists in a bigger macro context here that has everything to do with China's reform project uh, going ahead. Thanks. Let me open the, the floor to question. Ambassador Roy. Thank you for the great presentation. The, oh, uh, thank you for the great presentations. Uh, two linked questions. Uh, we have un unilaterally walked away from TPP. Uh, China is not a member of TPP but we are denying ourselves the market opening aspects of TPP in many of the major economies in East Asia. Will that have a negligible impact on the direction of U.S. investment flows? Uh, I just wonder, China remains a fixed thing, but uh, will have a less uh, attractive investment environment in some of the other Asian economies by not being part of TPP? That's question one. Question two. Given the gigantic spike in China's acquisitions uh, in 2016, could you provide a little context for that? Uh, China's acquisitions are now approaching $50 billion. Uh, if that keeps up, where does that put China in terms of other foreign investors engaging in acquisitions in the United States? And do we have figures for U.S. acquisitions of U.S. companies domestically? I just wonder, is China still a bit player, or you know, does Germany and European uh, acquisition investment in the United States dwarf, or is it a... I need the context. Mm -hmm. Let me make a comment on the first part, and we others on the second. Um, if you believed that TPP was a bulwark uh, securing American presence in the world and that that was going to have a positive impact on the environment for global capital flows, that it filled the vacuum that companies hate, the sense that Pax Americana is coming apart at the seams and we're shifting to a new era, then TPP should have been very supportive to global capital flows in general, including to China's benefit of maintaining business as basically usual in geopolitics. And if you believe that our withdrawal from TPP leaves a big empty space and question mark over where things are headed and that this will actually invite a kind of test of geopolitical wills, that should generally not be helpful to either Chinese or American uh, commercial investing interests, I would say. On the other hand, not everybody was convinced that TPP was really that multilateral, that effective um, a platform. Um, I'm inclined to think it was more beneficial than it was problematic, frankly, at this point in, in time in history, um, but it's somewhat debatable. But I think that's how I would approach that, that very difficult uh, question. Well, on the 
context for total M&A versus Chinese M&A? I guess I would take that. Um, so <clears throat> uh, historically, looking back, China was uh, a minor um, um, participant in, in global M&A markets. Uh, um, global M&A was dominated by U.S. companies, European companies, a lot of um, intra-European M&A, if, if you count that internationally. <clears throat> but certainly the, the curve that we're seeing right here has, has uh, uh, brought China into the top ranks of, of global um, investors. If you look at 2016 only, uh, China closed, if you look at closed transactions only, China closed about $150 billion worth of deals globally. Um, which puts it right behind the U.S. Uh, in second position for global M&A transactions. So really tremendous increase from like pretty much nothing uh, five, six years ago. Um, in terms of uh, the share of total inward FDI into the U.S., it's a little complicated because we, uh, <clears throat> again, we, we only have the official BEA figures with a pretty long time lag, so it's a little complicated to compare our numbers against uh, uh, official U.S. government data. Um, but I would say uh, China, uh, looking at the 2016 dynamics, uh, China, and, and considering Chinese M&A for what they are, because most commonly they would be considered Hong Kong investments or Cayman Island investments in the official statistics. But taking them the way we see them, I think uh, China by now should be among the top three uh, investors in the U.S. in terms of total, top three in terms of annual flows. Canada. Certainly not. Yeah, uh, I would say ca Canada, uh, the UK, uh, Germany are probably the, the, the closest competitors. But um, 2016, if I would have to take a guess, uh, we'd end up China uh, being one of the top three. Not the top investor probably, but one of the top three. So what's the total M&A market in the world? Uh, I haven't looked at the 2016 figures. What is, what is the total? Well, the Global the, the global, global, global M&A. Yeah. When I said Lehman Brothers, I had a chart, and we used to show that we had the biggest percentage. <laughs> well, it depends. But I don't remember. It depends if you only count cross-border M&A versus if you include domestic. domestic. No, right. it, 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 State was asking, I think, about domestic, U.S. Well, domestic. Well, inbound. Uh, it, it, I think I think these guys have the the overall data, and this is not um, a direct answer to State's question, but just as another point of reference. With respect to <clears throat> CFIUS filings in 2016, which does not reflect the total amount of inbound investment, um, but just within that narrow circle, not surprisingly, whenever the data comes out, it may be by 2020 that it's finally out. But um, uh, I would expect to see at least Chinese deals accounting for three or four times the amount of transactions filed over any other country. At CFIUS. That's with that's CFIUS, CFIUS, yeah. But that's yeah. a reflection of the political, I suppose. The volume of transactions and the fact that Chinese right. deals are filed when others don't have to be filed. Stape, as, as you would recall, the, the Chinese, when TPP looked like it might go ahead, the Chinese were deeply worried about trade and investment diversion. That, the, that if, since they were not part of what effectively was a common market, they were afraid that people would choose, that companies would choose to invest in Vietnam, in Korea, and other places where they would get the, the, the tariff barrier. But they were deeply, deeply worried about it. And therefore, I think ultimately, if it had gone ahead, would have wanted to have been included in it in some way. It would have been a terrific way to force China to do what it did in 2001, that China's entry into TPP would have required it to comply with rules which would have implemented the, the, the third party plenum reforms. I think there is little question that if, there are so many ifs in that, but clearly that would have been what Zhu Rongji did in WTO accession, forced China to do many, many things in one fell swoop. Xi Jinping would have done in TPP accession. Obviously, there would have been a, long, a longer timeline, but ultimately China, to avoid that trade um, and investment diversion, would have had to ultimately become a member, I think. Questions? Sorry. OK, thank you, Mr. Orange. I'm a reporter from China Daily. I thank you for the presentations and the panel discussion. And in fact, I'm still fresh from the Belt and Re 
Belt and Road Initiative, you know, I, I think on Sunday, the U.S. announced that it has formed a, a, the American Belt and Road Working Group to facilitate U.S. companies' participation in the Belt and Road projects. My question is, do you envision the Belt and Road Initiative to help reshape the, uh, the two-way street uh, uh, the landscape in this two-way uh, two street uh, we discussed today. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to make a funny remark, and then I bet Pilo will make a more serious one. But that's it's very good news that the U.S. can be part of Belt and Road because uh, last Friday, Beijing announced that one Belt, one Road countries will not have capital controls put on outbound direct investment to them, even though Beijing had never admitted that it formally had capital controls anyway. But if it did, they don't apply to OBOR countries. And if U.S. is in the mix, then there's no capital control, Steve. Good news. You can do whatever deals you want. There's not going to be a problem. Hila, is, is, does, does OBOR shape the, the U.S.-China story much, do you think? Um, oh, Beyond well, that. <clears throat> so so as, as, you, as, as you saw, I like to look at, at data and, and hard data. And, um, um, you know, I, I think one belt, one road is, is, a, is, a, is a great concept. It's an interesting concept, and it has a lot of potential to uh, reshape global capital flows and, and uh, <clears throat> stimulate the global economy. Um, at the same time, um, there are a lot of unanswered questions about how um, uh, how much investment is actually going to happen. And if you if you actually look at the numbers. Um, Chinese investment in OBOR economies it, um, wasn't particularly uh, uh, great uh, over the last two or three years. And it certainly, I think the latest numbers that the Chinese Ministry of Commerce has put out shows actually a decline uh, of Chinese investment in those one belt, one road economies, which I think there's still, still questions about what counts as OBOR economy. Uh, but looking at the Chinese official figures, we're actually seeing a downtrend. Now, much of that capital expenditure uh, could happen down the road because um, um, much of it is greenfield investment, so it takes a little, a little more time than M&A to, to actually materialize. But there are some serious questions about um, how much firepower there is actually behind, uh, behind um, uh, a lot of these uh, countries, how much commercial appetite is there to put a lot of assets into uh, uh, countries like Kazakhstan after the experiences that China had with Venezuela and some of the other uh, um, development investments they've, they've made in the past. So there are a lot of uncertainties. Um, with regard to the U.S.-China flow, um, uh, I guess the, the first question is, is it going to crowd out uh, Chinese outbound investment to the U.S.? So is there a policy uh, uh, imperative that Beijing is saying we're, we're giving preference to OBOR countries? Um, and so that could negatively impact the Chinese outbound investment in the U.S. It's not really uh, substitutable, <clears throat> though, is it? Exactly. Well, but, I mean, if, if, if Beijing controls some of the financing through state-owned banks and, 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 and um, other channels, then there's some, some leeway of, of channeling those, um, those uh, flows. Um, at the same time, so from what we have um, seen from conversations with Chinese uh, funds and companies is that um, – um, there is a lot of investment going on that is labeled as one belt, one road, um, but that end up in, uh, you know, things like carnival cruise ships and, and, and infrastructure investment all across the world, and it's just used as a, a label, and I don't know, if Steve, if you, if you have a, a view on that. But so, again, there's a lot of uncertainty. I don't think it changes the, the fundamentals that Dan described, that there's a lot of appetite for, uh, for uh, U.S. companies uh, to invest in China and for Chinese companies to expand their footprint in the U.S. Um, but beyond that, I, I really, from the numbers that I'm looking at, um, it's currently not having a, a, a huge impact in everything else. There's too much uncertainty, really, for me to comment on. Uh, I think what uh, I think that what I would add is it's an important initiative, and, uh, and there is a certain amount of, uh, of uncertainty around it, and I think everybody is waiting to see how it actually is implemented in practice. Um, I do think that it will positively impact global capital flows. That's in, in, in part the design, and, and I think when we see really in practice what it means, uh, it will overall be positive. With respect to the topic at hand, though, 
I would not expect that there would be any kind of crowding out because using your example of investment in Kazakhstan, a, a Chinese corporate that wants to invest there and whether it's a greenfield project or, uh, or takeover of a company, the reason you're going to make an investment in Kazakhstan is very different than what you may acquire through an M&A process in the U.S. So I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, I think overall it's going to be beneficial for global capital flows, but we, I think everybody has to just wait and see how it's implemented and what it really looks like in practice. Uh, but I think overall it's a very positive initiative. Over here. Hi, I'm Arbor Johnson with Itochu. Robert touched a little bit on trade remedies, but I wanted to push a little more on the possibility of aluminum and steel um, being designated as security, um, maybe under CFIUS, maybe otherwise, and how that might impact Chinese FDI into the U.S. So, <clears throat> um, You know, it's obviously it's something that's being looked at by the government. There was the announced 232 investigation, um, although China wasn't named anywhere in that. That, that clearly was, was a big part of it. Um, I think as a result, because it's a policy issue that's being looked at, it will come up as a question that may arise in specific transactions, including through CFIUS. Whether that specific topic or issue gets added legislatively or through an executive order to the list of criteria that CFIUS formally has to consider, I think is more uncertain. Um, but it would be natural for the agencies who have responsibility for that investigation, who also happen to sit on CFIUS, to use all available mechanisms to study the issue, and that includes potentially collecting data through specific CFIUS filings and the like. Um, I, I would not expect that CFIUS ultimately will be used as a trade remedy tool. I think the government has other trade remedy tools. Um, but it is a process that could be leveraged to make the trade remedy decisions potentially more informed. Um, I want to add a point on this. So we have uh, some experience, right, with uh, – powerful, growing Asian economy, uh, shipping huge amounts of uh, uh, product, in this case, aluminum and steel, steel, we're talking about, to the United States, trade barriers being put in place, effective ones, right, um, that actually do uh, uh, stop the importation of steel, for example, to, to the United States. I'm talking about Japan in the 1980s. That led to an effect, a spillover effect in direct investment. And the effect was massive Japanese direct investment into the United States to be on the other side of that tariff barrier. So they were not impacted by either prohibitive uh, barriers on, in a 232 national security context or just prohibitively high economic barriers to offset subsidies and what have you. That's why there are today over 800,000 Americans working for Japanese-affiliated companies in the U.S. It was trade protection leads to direct investment, leads to Japanese presence in the U.S. economy. We're set up for potentially some of the same pattern with regard to Chinese uh, presence here. And New Neighbors, the study we also do with Steve that we put out about three weeks ago here in town, uh, our new job, Teal's new job count on Chinese jobs in the U.S., 140,000 Americans directly employed uh, in full-time jobs by Chinese-related uh, firms here. 140,000 versus 850,000 with Japanese firms. There's so little room to go here, and the trade politics can actually be supportive of the direct investment inflows as Chinese firms try to hop that barrier, those barriers, and uh, be domiciled here. And we actually do have examples for that kind of tariff jumping greenfield investment in our database. If you look at um, Chanchin Pipe Corporation in, in Texas, um, and so there, there is a, an increase of um, larger greenfield investments and acquisitions. Um, um, Chongwang Aleris is one of the aluminum cases 
currently pending. I don't know if you guys are involved, but um, there, there is activity, investment activity, both in Greenfield and M&A, um, that will lead to localization of production in the U.S. Maybe to make an, an obvious point to connect the two, for there to be coherence in that policy, you can't say we're going to raise the trade, raise the trade barriers to incentivize invest, where, where consequences to incentivize investment, and then at the same time block the investment. I mean, so that's why I would say <clears throat> I think it's going to be a factor that the government may leverage the CFIUS process on specific cases in the manufacturing sector in the aluminum steel to get more information. But unless there is actually a true national security issue in that particular transaction, I would not expect the issues with respect to aluminum and steel to dictate CFIUS outcomes. If there's not a national security issue, that's the type of investment that you would want to attract. By the way, those of you who are interested in Dan, men Dan mentioned New Neighbors, the study we came out with, which analyzes down to the congressional district uh, jobs provided by Chinese employers in the United States. Their copies, the executive summary, I think, is out, is, is right there. If on your way out you want to grab a copy. Next question. We'll go for about another 10 minutes. Uh, Panga with China, Xinhua Liu, Xinhua Liu. Uh, as the U.S. administration has announced one training, uh, your store if, if structure investment plan, I'm wondering what's the panel's take on the prospects of a Chinese com companies' uh, investment in the U.S. infrastructure. We also did a study on that, right? <laughs> well, I, I guess because nobody's jumping right in. Um, David and, uh, well, Covington and Rhodium uh, did a, uh, a study together jointly with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce a couple years ago called International to Interstates, something like that. It wasn't our best title, but... Uh, opportunities and Challenges for Chinese Investment. Oh, no, they had that. The US, right. had that the cliche in it as well. Right. Um, right. But what we did was we projected out to 2030 what the maintenance cost is of American infrastructure, right, in four big clusters, transportation, energy, water, and I can't remember what else, um, and very quickly got to a minimum price tag of $8 trillion of work that needs to be done. And it's well understood that U.S. gasoline tax revenues have fallen off dramatically. There is not actually a uh, budget uh, source and allocation to cover U.S. infrastructure uh, needs. And so then the rest of the report and David's contribution to it was looking at the legal modalities for Chinese participation in public-private partnerships, and other avenues for involving Chinese participation in U.S. infrastructure. Bottom line is there's a big opportunity, and there's a lot of talk uh, about how to bring it all together and make it happen. There are some uh, enduring national security issues. For example, uh, our rail lines tend to have telecom lines buried underneath them because they have right-of-ways uh, already in place for backbone telecom lines, which is kind of in that area where our national security people get a little anxious. Um, so there's issues there, but there's a gargantuan opportunity. Tilo and I have and are aware of a tremendous amount of Chinese participation already in bridge, tunnel, road refurbishment around the country. That's not, not necessarily the same thing as a big FDI footprint. It's more contract by contract, um, although we are starting to see some big CRRC investments now in Springfield, Massachusetts, and elsewhere in preparation to build rail cars uh, for Boston, Philadelphia, uh, New York and, and elsewhere. You know, I, I think that the, the, look, the report's conclusion is there's a need for foreign direct investment and private investment into the infrastructure. <clears throat> so there are opportunities there. The challenges, there are some regulatory challenges, but I, the conclusion of that is there also would be, there absolutely would be specific projects that would, should be open to Chinese investment. They, are not even all going to be covered transactions that would create national security issues and where there are there may be some segments of the infrastructure that are less sensitive than others the key conclusion on the regulatory defined broadly um, landscape was this often turns on local politics and the local politics around infrastructure projects can be very complicated and it's not just complicated for chinese investors it's complicated for private participants um, that those complications can be accentuated with foreign investment and then in particular Chinese investment. Um, so you know, the answer is yes, there should be opportunities. 
it, it is not possible to accomplish what the country needs to accomplish from an infrastructure investment standpoint and what this administration has articulated that they want to accomplish from an infrastructure investment standpoint without getting foreign investment and having private participation. That, would, that should be a natural opportunity for, for China. Um, there are complexities that are not just federal regulation that often revolve around local politics, which are the case in all infrastructure projects, but the, the inflow of foreign investment can sometimes make those even more complicated. Um, so that, that's, the, that's essentially the summary from that report. My name is Alice from the Hoover Institution at Stanford. I have two very brief questions, one on the Chinese side. How do U.S. investors think about PPPs, especially when a lot of people in China see them as new versions of local government financing vehicles? And secondly, on the American side, um, will the administration, I guess, clamp down more on uh, Chinese VC investment in early stage uh, companies involved in VR, AR, especially because it seems to me to be quite germane to some national security issues? I can take the second one. You guys want to take the first one? Or how, how do U.S. investors view public-private participation? In the, uh, I, I want, I'm sorry. Can we, can we do the first question again, please? I just want to make sure that I really understand what you're trying to get. Yeah, sure. So um, a lot of the uh, growth, I guess, in China this year um, is going to be infrastructure-led, and, and PPPs are really going to drive that. But there's a lot of skepticism when we talk to people in Beijing about PPPs, and some people say that they're just another form of local government financing vehicles. Um, with that inbred risk, how do U.S. investors think about um, involvement, participation in, in PPPs? Is it something that they completely avoid for the financial risks cited above? I, I can introduce an answer to that if, if you'll agree to let me pass it to you. Sure. Okay. So, look, uh, public-private partnership structures are a uh, contract form to get a project, a local project done. Uh, we use them in the United States. They're used around the world. China is now showing an appetite for these, too. They have the virtue from Chinese government perspective of bringing Chinese money and private share of equity in the project to the table. And so there's a kind of multiplier of capital formation, if you will, right? Um, it, it crowds in private money, so it's not all just on government budget for infrastructure investment. The problem is we're working with a legacy of what the questioner noted, local government finance vehicles which were hastily um, approved um, uh, commercial structures to do the same thing in the teeth of the global financial crisis, 2008, 2009, which have created hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars of unrecoverable debt, which is poisoning China's future potential, frankly, if it's not worked out and, and addressed more quickly. So the concern is that these PPP structures haven't fundamentally answered the question, how are we going to make sure that doesn't happen again, this time with this new flavor of investment vehicle? But I think for our FDI discussion here today, and Steve, I'm curious what you think about this, foreign direct investment is a really high-quality alternative to getting smart money to work where the government doesn't have to worry about holding everybody's hand and ultimately subsidizing the non-performing loan problem where foreign firms are willing to take these risks and bring more diligence in uh, financial decision making about what to do and what not to do, right? Um, that can be a really excellent demonstration of how to lead the investment process out of the woods here. So we don't need to keep creating new generations of kind of questionable vehicles to get work going at the local level. But so, Steve, what do, you, what do you think of my way of looking at that? Well, I think it's the, the right way to look at it because the legacy, the legacy issues out of public-private partnerships has been difficult is probably the fairest characterization of it. So viewing foreign direct investment as almost the next generation of some of the, the – and addressing some of the issues around that, in fact, I think it's the right way – is really the right way to be looking at it. The ability to get to some of the same results that, they, the, that the public-private partnerships were designed to 
get to, but doing it from a foreign direct investment, I think, is a better solution. And there's a recognition from certainly the investor side and the corporate side that they can get do the work themselves. They're not relying on uh, a, a, a vehicle that had not only economic implications, but was uh, there's a little bit of social engineering in it to get to a, a better result for the money going in. Um, so I think the foreign direct investment flows are probably best viewed as sort of the next generation and, in fact, a, a good solution to some of the pro legacy problems that were created by uh, the PPVs. So, David. Yeah, the second question. Um, and also, I, this is your, your, your wrap-up opportunity. Okay. Um, well, it's a good wrap-up. So uh, this, I think the second question was, do we expect that there could be concerns with respect to um, Chinese venture capital investment in early stage technology companies, in particular in the area of artificial intelligence? Um, which, is, which is a good question, very timely. Um, there is, you know, everybody in the Valley in some form or fashion is focusing on artificial intelligence. It's not just there, it's in the technology corridors, whether it's in Boston or Austin. Um, there is a fair amount of natural venture capital interest in that because of the potential growth opportunities. It also is core to creating efficiencies in a number of industries going forward and therefore is important for China and it's important for the U.S. Uh, and it's also an area that is directly relevant to the future plans of what the military machines look like for both the U.S. and China. Um, so it sort of cuts to the core of this issue that's animating the potential legislative or policy debate over Chinese investment in the U.S. in the technology sector, which is, is CFIUS capturing everything? Are there transactions that are out there that are not covered because they're small minority investments or they're arm's length commercial relationships that also provide for collaboration on the development of innovative technologies? And, and that was actually the, the study that Ash Carter requested and that the DIUX conducted was on this issue. Um, there's, there's different potential responses to that. One response would be, we, need, we, the U.S., needs to look at everything because it could create risk. And you don't know which artificial intelligence startup in Silicon Valley is actually going to be the one that produces this innovation that will, be a, that will help advance our national security interest and we don't want the Chinese to have access to that because that could advance theirs. And you don't know which one of these it's going to be at this stage, so you have to kind of protect all of them. Another, at the other end of the spectrum, it is there is no possible way to legislate and regulate that kind of innovation and collaboration. And under our system, which is an open investment environment where we rely upon the private sector and empower the private sector, to innovate, you do not want the government to legislate and regulate that. It will inhibit the innovation, and we have to assume some degree of risk that's inherent in that kind of open investment environment. And over the long run, we're going to bet that our system is better both for our economic security and for our national security than the Chinese system, which is more state controlled. And so we're not going to legislate it. We're not going to regulate it. What we're going to look for is other tools that we have on the national security side, counterintelligence, intelligence, other types of tools to try to protect as much as we can and ensure that we, meaning the U.S., benefits from that innovation. And if that innovation is relevant to national security, we benefit from it more than other countries and rivals, including China. That, those are the two ends of the spectrum. It's kind of assume the risk and we're going to bet on ourselves long run in our system, or you got to totally protect it and shut it down. And where that comes out as a legislative matter, as a policy matter, and in the context of specific transactions right now is unknown. You could talk to 20 people or 100 people in government or on the Hill, and you would get widely different answers. That is, and th that's exactly the debate that's going on. And, you know, we'll see if we're back here in a year and have more of an answer if it's still going on then. And let me just 
add, if I may. <laughs> uh, part of uh, the answer is creating more transparency on the data side, and the debate is currently largely happening on the basis of a not classified but non-public report that was put together by uh, an entity within uh, the security community, and we do not have transparency about these uh, VC investments. And we, in particular, uh, one thing that the debate is neglecting and that we, we've tried to highlight here is uh, what are uh, U.S. flows in the other direction in metro capital. And um, I just did the numbers back on the envelope, but you can be sure that there's at least two or three, four times as many uh, VC investments going into Chinese companies by U.S. private equity firms, venture capitalists. In fact, I can't think of a major Chinese software uh, company that hasn't gotten uh, early financing from, from the U.S. And so um, those questions about uh, reciprocity and potential uh, retaliation, if we put in place rules that Chinese will probably follow up with similar rules, I think those are all questions that haven't really properly been discussed. Um, and so we um, have a lot of work to do to uh, uh, bring transparency to that issue as well. David, you wanted some closing words, or those were your closing well, words? Well, I think that essentially just captured it. I, mean, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 I, I will just say, you know, I, I think Tilo, Tilo put the, the right exclamation point on the session in so far as the work that Dan and Tilo and the National Committee have done to try to actually put data into place to inform these policy considerations is really important. It's core. Um, and there are hard issues that are presented. They will continue to be presented. But having these kinds of inputs is extremely valuable. And these guys are the best at what they do. So we appreciate them, them doing it. Thank you for hosting. And thank you all for coming.